In a world that succumbed to a global parasitic fungal infection that turns people into bloodthirsty monsters, a man is tasked to deliver a girl across the country. To reach their destination, they must fight against the infected who now inhabit the apocalyptic wasteland. In 1968, a famous television show host interviews two epidemiologists, Dr. Sean Heiss and Dr. Newman, about the dangerous microorganisms that can hypothetically start a global pandemic. Sean Heiss explains the capabilities of viruses and bacteria as a recurring danger to human life, and mentions the discovery of a new virus in Madagascar. Hearing the straight-faced doctor's statement, the curious host turns to Newman for his opinion, and the doctor denies being worried about a possible pandemic caused by bacteria or viruses, much to the interviewer's confusion. Dr. Newman defends himself in a light tone, saying people will always be at war with viruses and bacteria, and that may result in many deaths, but in the end, humans will always prevail. However, the doctor's real concern is a pandemic brought about by a fungus, eliciting an amused response from the audience. Dr. Newman explains that there are certain species of fungus that are not known to kill, but to control its host. To further explain his point, the doctor gives an example, an ant infected by a fungus. The microorganism travels inside the ant's circulatory system to the brain, flooding it with hallucinogens, completely altering the ant's mind to obey its will. Dr. Newman likens the fungus to a puppeteer controlling a marionette, while also slowly eating its host's flesh. However, the ant's fate worsens as the fungus won't let it die by preventing decomposition, like a living corpse. In disagreement, Dr. Sean Heiss argues that while Dr. Newman's statement about fungal infections is factual, it is unlikely to affect humans. Newman agrees that fungi can't survive in a host with a temperature higher than 94 degrees Fahrenheit. However, he theorizes that if the world's temperature grows warmer, this might cause certain fungi to evolve. Thus, it could develop and gain the capability of borrowing into human brains. Dr. Newman continues that billions of fungi-affected humans will have one terrifying goal, to spread infection. He adds that there are no known treatments, no preventatives, and he doubts anyone can find a cure if it happens. Fearful, the host asks what humanity's recourse would be, and the doctor just shakes his head and says humanity would lose, to which even the skeptical Dr. Shanghais agrees. In 2003, Sarah Miller wakes up from the light shining from her window and looks up at her clock. She then hurriedly knocks on her father's bedroom door to wake him from his slumber. Later, Sarah cooks eggs for breakfast and then searches the cupboard for the pancake mix. Hearing her father's footsteps, Sarah asks where the pancake mix is. Joel, her father, enters the kitchen and apologizes for forgetting to buy some. Sarah complains that she wanted to make him pancakes for his 36th birthday. While they sit at the table, Joel's brother Tommy arrives. The brothers speak about overtime work as construction workers, but Sarah interjects that it's her father's birthday. To appease her, Joel promises to get his job done by 9 and to buy a cake for dinner. Sarah heads upstairs to get her bag, but not before entering her father's room and sneakily snatching a couple of dollars along with her father's broken watch. Outside, Danny Adler, their neighbor, feeds an elderly wheelchair-bound woman, Nana. He asks when Sarah will come by to visit, because his wife has been asking. Joel tells Danny his daughter will join them after school, and Sarah grumbles as they leave. At school, Sarah impatiently sits in class when a glimmer of light flashes across her face. She looks over and sees her classmate's medical alert bracelet reflecting in her direction, noting the odd twitching of the person's hand. The bell rings to signal the end of the school, and she rushes to catch a bus to the city. In a watch repair shop, Sarah asks the owner, Nazir, to fix her dad's timepiece. She then notices the emergency vehicles rushing past the store window. Suddenly, a panicked Tahira explains in Arabic that she'd gotten a phone call from her sister about distressing events. As Nazir hands the fixed watch to Sarah, Tahira steers her out of the shop, tells her to head home immediately before locking up. Sarah goes to the Adler's residence where Connie, Danny's wife, welcomes her in. As she enters, Mercy, the border collie, runs to the teenager for pets. Then, Sarah asks the older woman if she's seen any concerning news on TV, but Connie disregards her worry. After finishing her homework, Sarah scans the Adler's DVD collection. Behind her, Nana starts twitching in an unnatural manner, uncharacteristic of the typically catatonic woman. Oblivious to Nana's strange behavior, Sarah returns to the kitchen holding a DVD and asks Connie if she can borrow it. As she's about to leave, Sarah sees Mercy staring at Nana and whimpering, adding to her befuddlement. That evening, Sarah sits on the couch waiting for her father. The TV shows a news report of scattered incidents of violent behavior around the city attributed to an illegal substance. Moments later, Joel arrives and joins her on the couch. He apologizes to his daughter for being late and forgetting to buy the cake. Sarah asks him to swear to buy a cake for her the next day in exchange for a gift, making Joel smile. Sarah hands him the box and he happily opens it to see his old watch ticking. He puts it on and asks where she got the money from, and she jokingly says she peddles illegal substances for cash. 
pleased, Joel shyly thanks Sarah, who takes out the DVD of Joel's favorite movie that she borrowed from the Adlers, and they watch it while cuddling on the couch. Hours later, while his daughter sleeps on his lap, Joel receives a phone call from Tommy who says he's in jail and needs Joel to bail him out. Left with no choice, Joel carries his sleeping daughter to her bedroom, before leaving the house at 11pm. Three hours later, Sarah wakes up from the rumbling chaos outside and searches for her father. Realizing she's alone, Sarah turns the TV on to see a national emergency alert broadcast advising people to stay indoors for safety. Suddenly, a loud banging sound startles Sarah, and she turns to see a frightened Mercy pawing at the door. Comforting the whimpering dog, Sarah tries to bring Mercy back, but the dog runs away in fear of the Adler's open door, confusing the teen. Sarah cautiously enters the neighbor's house, and to her shock, she finds an injured Danny sitting on the kitchen floor, bleeding and begging for help. The older man glances at something behind the counter, and when Sarah follows his gaze, she sees Nana biting down on Connie's neck. The elderly woman raises her head, showing the tendrils growing from her mouth. The woman notices Sarah's presence and chases her, so Sarah runs out the front door to escape. Outside, Joel and Tommy arrive in the truck. Joel orders her to get in the vehicle just as Nana appears, snarling and running toward them. Joel smashes a wrench on the woman's head, incapacitating her. Joel apologizes to his terrified daughter and tries to explain the situation, but an explosion interrupts them. Tommy then hurries them to get in the vehicle. As they drive off, Sarah sees her father and uncle in a frantic state, as police cars drive past them in a hurry. Worried, Sarah asks them about the situation, but all they've heard from others is that there's a spreading infection in the city. The brothers plan to go to Mexico to escape, just as they pass a stranded family on the highway. Joel insists on ignoring them despite Sarah's pleas to let them ride in the back of the pickup truck. He believes they need to prioritize their own safety first. Unfortunately, all the main roads are either stuck in traffic or blocked by the military, so the Millers decide to drive into town. In town, the streets flood with people running away from the infected. During the disarray, a passenger plane falls from the sky and crashes on the street. A piece of flying debris hits their vehicle, causing it to tip it over and crash. Minutes later, the three regain consciousness and find themselves in a dangerous circumstance as the infected continue swarming the area. Sarah injured her ankle during the accident, prompting Joel to carry her in his arms. Tommy gets separated when another vehicle crashes into theirs, impeding him from joining Joel and Sarah in an alley. The brothers agree to meet at the field near the river. Moments later, an infected man spots Joel and Sarah and chases them into a building. With his daughter in his arms, Joel barely escapes the infected as it scrambles after them like a madman. After Joel and Sarah escape through the back exit, a soldier shoots the infected just in time. The soldier asks for their current status, and Joel conveys that Sarah hurt her leg in an accident, and that they aren't infected. The soldier keeps his gun pointed at Joel, while asking for his superior's orders through the radio. The soldier apologizes before shooting at Joel and they fall down a hill. When the soldier sees Joel still alive, he points to shoot again, but Tommy guns down the soldier first. Joel lifts his shirt to reveal a bullet graze on his torso. Unfortunately, Sarah sustained a serious injury in her abdomen as she desperately gasps her air. Joel crawls to her side and tries to save her, but his daughter ultimately perishes in his arms. 20 years later, Joel lives in a quarantine zone in Boston, where he works odd jobs including the disposal of infected deceased bodies in a bonfire. A woman and Joel open a truck full of corpses. Upon seeing a child's body, the woman tells Joel she can't bring herself to do it, so Joel emotionlessly tosses the corpse into the fire himself. At the end of the workday, Joel and the other workers collect their payment from a Fedra soldier. He asks the officer for another job and takes the high-paying sewer maintenance gig. Traversing the dire and hopeless city, Joel comes across a public hanging of lawbreakers and signals a soldier, Lee, to an empty corner for their transaction. Joel hands Lee a baggie of substances in exchange for ration cards and a few cigarettes. Then, Joel asks for the status of the vehicle that he wants. Lee tells him that he's recruited other soldiers to help Joel prepare for his journey. Before leaving, Lee advises Joel to stay home for a while due to the ongoing battle between the Fedra soldiers and the rebel group Fireflies. Elsewhere, Robert negotiates with the battered woman, Tess. He nervously explains that he resold the car battery Tess had already paid for. He asks the woman to forget how his men had roughed her up if he sets her free, because he fears Joel's retaliation. She convinces him she'll speak to Joel and find an excuse regarding her injury. Suddenly, a blast destroys the wall and Tess escapes. As she makes her way home, Tess is caught in the Fedra and Fireflies crossfire and is arrested under suspicion of being a rebel. Somewhere, a teen is chained and locked up in a room under the Fireflies' watch. She angrily shouts at her captors, insisting they set her free because Fedra is looking for her. Meanwhile, Joe meets with the radio caller Abe, pays the man in cigarettes, and asks if he's received any messages about Tommy. Abe tells Joe that despite round-the-clock surveillance on the radio, no one's heard from Tommy, who is currently in Wyoming. 
The radio caller discourages Joel from venturing out to search for his brother, even if he knows Joel is capable. He warns that his trip from Boston to Wyoming is dangerous, according to what he's heard on the radio. Determined, Joel still asks Abe to mark his map with his destination and leaves. In his apartment, Joel pushes the wardrobe aside, removes the floorboard, and takes out a map. Joel studies with great concentration as he drinks alcohol and doses himself with several tablets. On his wrist, he wears the watch Sarah got repaired. Soon, he gets in bed where Tess joins him hours later. The next day, Joel sees Tess's injuries, which he initially lies about, but after some soft questioning, Tess comes clean about Robert's men roughing her up after she confronted him on the resold car battery. Angered, Joel plans to hunt down Robert and his men. Tess tells him to calm down and suggest they stealthily steal their battery and money back so they can leave as soon as possible, to which Joel agrees. Before they leave their apartment, Joel takes out his guns from his hidden compartment. Meanwhile, Marlene, leader of the Fireflies, enters a room where three people are planning out their next attack. Kim, second in command, inquires about their leader's motivation for doing business with Robert and holding a female prisoner in their hideout. After dismissing the others, Marlene gives her a piece of paper containing information that instantly convinces Kim to continue their plan, and she vows to do whatever she can to help her leader and keep the information secret. Marlene visits their prisoner, returns her backpack, and sits beside her holding a knife she retrieved from the bag. Marlene releases her from her chain and reveals that she knows the teen's real name is Ellie. When Marlene asks where Ellie plans to go if they release her, Ellie says she might return to Fedra to become a soldier since it's where she grew up. When she notes Marlene's displeased reaction, Ellie asks why the woman cares what happens to her. So, Marlene reveals that she was the one who took Ellie to Fedra when she was an infant, because that was where she'd be safest. Marlene then tells Ellie about her important role in their crusade, and warns her never to reveal it to other people. Meanwhile, Joel and Tess enter the building where they suspect Robert is selling their battery. They climb up through the sewer, where they come across the gruesome remains of an infected, plastered on the wall. When they open the door into the hallway, they find Robert and his men's corpses, along with the unusable battery. Joel sees an injured Marlene and Kim at the end of the hall, where he gets attacked by Ellie. He quickly disarms her and points his gun. Marlene recognizes Joel and he shows clear disdain, implying she was the cause of his and Tommy's estrangement. Marlene explains Robert tried selling them the dead battery, which caused the ensuing shootout. With no other choice and knowing Joel's capabilities, Marlene asks him to take Ellie to a specific location in exchange for all the things they'll need to search for Tommy. After a short discussion, Joel and Tess agree to the mission and hastily take Ellie, who has no choice but to follow. Reaching the apartment, Joel and Tess let Ellie inside before closing the door so they can converse in private. Annoyed at being left out, Ellie finds a piece of paper with codes written on it. 60s songs means no new stuff, 70s for new stock, and 80s is marked with an X. When Joel enters the room, Ellie asks about the code and the identity of Bill and Frank, to which Joel doesn't answer. Joel takes a nap while waiting for Tess's return, while Ellie sits by the window. Later, Joel wakes up and Ellie informs him that she heard the radio playing Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, and he gets worried. Ellie immediately deduces that 80 songs mean danger, catching Joel off guard. As Tess returns, the trio sneakily ventures out as the Fedra soldiers guard the streets. Unfortunately, Lee spots them escaping the quarantine zone borders. Lee points his gun at the trio and orders them to kneel on the ground. One by one, he scans them, while Tess and Joel bargain with him. When he reaches Ellie, she attacks him with her knife, angering the soldier. Lee points his gun at Ellie and the sight causes Joel to remember his daughter's death, so he tackles Lee and punches his face in rage. Ellie watches the man's uncontrollable anger fearfully. Meanwhile, Tess picks up the scanner glowing a bright red, indicating Ellie's infection. Ellie tries to convince them that she's not sick, and reveals her weeks-old healed wound and says no one has lasted without symptoms after a bite like she has. Suddenly, a siren wails from afar, signaling that the Fedra soldiers are coming, so they hurriedly climb through the fence. In Joel's apartment, the radio plays the 80s song, Never Let Me Down Again. In 2003 in Jakarta, Indonesia, two days before outbreak day, Professor Ibu Ratna, an expert in mycology at the University of Indonesia, is approached by two high-ranking police officers and asked to come with them. Inside the vehicle, Professor Ibu asks worriedly if she's committed a crime. Lieutenant General Agus Hidayat explains that they require her assistance as someone knowledgeable in mycology. They arrive at a laboratory and enter the restricted area. Agus asks the professor to view a specimen under a microscope, which the professor identifies as Alfio cordyceps. She's puzzled as to why the slide was prepared like a human specimen. The lieutenant general explains that the sample was, in fact, collected from a human being, making Ibu skeptical, since the cordyceps fungi can't survive in humans. Moments later, Agus escorts Ibu deeper into the laboratory and shows her a woman's corpse. While the lieutenant general guides her from an observation room, the professor enters the quarantined room in a hazmat suit. Agus advises Ibu to leave the room if she starts to feel ill. 
Ibu examines the corpse, noting the bullet wound in the forehead. She finds a human bite mark near the left ankle and cuts it open, only to see fungi growing inside, shocking the professor. As tension rises, Ibu moves to the woman's mouth where she discovers mycelium tendrils moving around the orifice. She quickly runs toward the door in fear and panic. A few minutes later, Agus offers a cup of tea to calm the shaken professor. She asks him where they found the woman, and he explains that the incident happened approximately 30 hours ago in a rural flower and grain factory. The woman suddenly became violent and bit three co-workers. All bitten victims also turned and were taken out by the police. He adds that the person who bit the victim hasn't been found yet, and 14 other workers are said to be missing. After hearing this information, Ibu calmly explains the hard truth to the lieutenant general. The professor states that there is no treatment or vaccine for a cordyceps infection, and with a heavy heart, believes the only solution is to bomb the entire city with everyone in it. Ibu tearfully requests that she be allowed to go home to be with her family, before the inevitable chaos. In the present, Ellie wakes from her slumber and sees Joel and Tess watching her, while holding guns. Tess demands she tell them why Marlene thinks she's so important, and threatens to take her back. Left without a choice, Ellie confesses that the Fireflies believe her immunity is key in creating a vaccine. However, Joel is skeptical because rumors of a vaccine have never turned out to be true. Yet, Tess persuades the men to follow through, since they badly need the car battery and the promised supplies to search for Tommy. As they continue the journey, Ellie is in awe of the city ruins, since she's never been outside the quarantine zone before. As they look at their blocked path to the state house, Joel remarks that they have two options, the long way or the short, but more dangerous way, prompting Tess and Ellie to choose the safer route. On their way to the hotel, Jess curiously asks how Ellie got bitten, and the teen admits she snuck into the abandoned mall alone, where she was attacked. Tess compliments her courage for surviving, making Ellie smile. Noting the eerie quiet, Ellie asks why she was led to believe that the open city is swarming with infected. Suddenly, they hear a terrifying scream, making the group stop in their tracks. With a determined look, Joel urges them to keep moving forward. In the hotel, they wade through the flooded lobby to access the stairs. After climbing several floors, the group reaches a hallway with a narrow opening above the debris. Tess climbs up to find a way to open the locked doors for her companions. Left alone, Joel and Ellie have a small awkward talk about the infected's lifespan and how Joel feels whenever he slays one. Tess interrupts the conversation after successfully opening the door, and Joel notices her anxious expression as she beckons them. From the balcony, they see a large group of infected slithering on the ground, blocking their way to the state house. Seeing the infected horde's movements, Ellie notes how they seem connected. Tess explains that fungus grows deep in the ground with its long fiber stretching over a mile, connecting all infected in one area. When one patch of cordyceps is disturbed, a dozen infected are alerted. Although Ellie's immunity can save her from infection, she's not immune from being ripped apart. The group has no choice but to use the short way through the museum. Outside the fungi-covered building, Tess reassures Ellie that it used to be a serviceable route. Assessing the building, Joel indicates that the mycelium is mostly dry, possibly because the infected inside are finally dead. Inside, Ellie finds a fresh corpse that was violently attacked. Tess and Joel inspect the body and share a knowing look. Tess tries to convince Joel that the man would have been attacked outside and just crept into the museum for safety. Sensing danger, Joel demands total silence as they climb the stairs, caked with multiple carcasses of infected. They enter a room on the top floor, just as the ceiling by the doorway collapses, creating a loud noise. Suddenly, they hear a terrifying clicking sound and snap into attack mode. They slowly pace back, finding a large glass case shielding themselves from whatever is approaching. As the creature appears before them, Ellie sees a clicker for the first time. Joel mouths that the clickers can't see, but they can hear very well. Suddenly, a clicker stumbles in front of the group, making Ellie gasp in fear upon seeing its face, alerting the creature. Joel fires at the clicker, but it disarms the man, making it difficult for him to fight back. Then, another clicker appears and chases Tess and Ellie. However, the ladies trip over a mannequin, separating them. The clicker chases after Tess, while Ellie crawls away in panic. Meanwhile, Joel confronts the first clicker and distracts it by breaking a glass display. He hides behind a wall and carefully reloads his gun, sensing the clicker move closer to his location. The man sees Ellie and approaches her swiftly. They both crouch and move away from the infected, but Joel accidentally steps on shattered glass, alerting the clicker which lunges at them. Fortunately, Joel slays it by shooting its head. Another clicker appears and runs toward them. Tess arrives just in time and hits it with an axe, and Joel finishes the clicker with a shot to the head. After the encounter, Tess sustains a limp, and Ellie receives another bite on her arm. Worried, Tess urges everyone to move by crawling out a window to the roof. 
As Joel tends to Tessa's twisted ankle, he shares his concerns about Ellie being infected, but Tess snaps at him for being pessimistic. They travel to the meeting spot and wonder why the place seems deserted. Joel inspects the park truck in front of the state house, but only sees blood on the driver's seat. Unfortunately, the militia members seem to all have died when there was a shootout after several became infected. Frantic, Tess checks the bodies for a map or clue to find where the fireflies were supposed to take Ellie. Joel berates her and says they need to go home, since there's nothing they can do about the situation. Tess exasperatedly yells that the quarantine zone isn't her home. Ellie realizes that the older woman got bit, surprising Joel, who tells her to show them. Tess pulls her t-shirt collar aside to reveal a bite mark on her neck. She scoffs and sadly remarks that her luck had to run out at some point. Tess tells Ellie to remove the bandage, and the older woman shows Joel and tells him that Ellie is the real deal. She's been bitten twice and staved off infection both times. Tess pleads with Joel to take Ellie to Bill and Frank as her last request to set everything right. Suddenly, one of the infected tries to rise up from the floor, which Joel immediately shoots. However, the tendrils alert a nearby horde, and the infected head toward their location. Knowing the infected are coming, Tess knocks over the field drums and throws the grenades on the floor, telling Joel and Ellie that she'll ensure the infected won't follow them. Left with no choice, Joel grabs Ellie to escape through the back. As the horde breaks in, Tess can't ignite the lighter, and an infected man walks toward her. It opens its mouth and lets its tendrils enter the woman's. Finally, Tess ignites the flames and drops it on the floor, setting off a massive explosion. Joel and Ellie make it outside the building and watch the state house go up in flames. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.